Okay, welcome to Chapter 5, Cognitive Development, Improvements in Thinking, Reasoning, and Decision Making. Uh, in this chapter, we're basically going to look at um, the cognitive development of adolescents. And um, in that regard, we'll be speaking about uh, Piaget's stages of cognitive development, which includes the sensory motor stage, uh, which is birth uh, two through, excuse me, birth through uh, two years old, the pre-operational stage two through seven, the concrete operational stage seven through 11 or 12, and then the formal operational stage 11 to 12 or older. Uh, because this is an adolescent um, a development class, uh, and that human development across the lifespan will mainly focus on the adolescent area of cognitive development. So there's effects of adolescent thought on personality and behavior. And um, f there's some terms listed here. There's idealism, um, where does they think in terms of what it might be like, um, hypocrisy, um, pretending to be what they're not, and you find that to be a, a pretty common theme with adolescents. Um, this new term here, I do like this, pseudo-stupidity, approaching problems at much too complex a level and failing. Uh, adolescents don't particularly enjoy failing anything at anything, and uh, they usually get involved with uh, higher levels of um, thinking on very complex things, believing uh, that they will do fairly well. So when they fail, they don't take it too well. And this is usually due to that sense of um, egocentrism, that, that all about me that we talked about on the first day. Um, it is the fact that they believe that they, they do in fact have this imaginary audience, uh, that um, they are constantly being evaluated. And usually if they fail at something, they sense or they have a sense of negative evaluation. And that could be pretty detrimental to um, a, an individual who's in the adolescent phase of development. Introspection is something, is a term that we uh, usually go over in intro to psychology. And it's basically being able to think about uh, your thoughts in, in, a, in a nutshell. You're, you're going into deep thought. And... Um, Adolescents do do quite a bit of thinking. If you ask me, they're always in their heads. They're always thinking about what uh, someone else is thinking about them. Uh, and that goes into that uh, fear of negative evaluation yet again. Um, when it comes to cognitive development, um, you know, there's... With, when it comes to, to Piaget's formal operational stage, which begins in adolescence, it continues well into adulthood. And during this period, um, the adolescent begins to use deductive reasoning, and they use this reasoning to basically draw conclusions. And we might question quite a bit of those conclusions they come up with, but uh, right around that, that phase of development, deductive reasoning is usually central. Um, so the adolescent can think beyond what is going on in the moment. And uh, they usually ponder the future, and, and they try to consider many different um, possibilities or hypothetical situations. So again, they, they're always thinking. But when they do act, uh, you have to question the, their actions because, again, um, and we'll talk further on in this um, uh, slide here, what it is their their brains are, are really d doing at this particular phase. and. Um, we talked about uh, the frontal lobe of their brain still developing well into to adulthood. So anyway, so usually in adolescence, they, they begin to contemplate what it is will happen beyond high school. They might actually start to think about career choices. This might come into uh, the later part of their high school uh, phase. They, they might take, think about education, whether they want to further it or not. So, um, you know, there's a specific type of egocentrism that emerges in, adult, in adolescence. And before this age, you know, children can only imagine the world from their own perspective. Uh, hence them being, you know, egocentric. That, that egocentrism is still apparent uh, well into to adolescence, sometimes well into their 20s. So for an example of egocentrism, um, a teenager who focuses on his appearance 
you know, will will think that others are focusing on his appearance as well. And and hence there's the negative evaluation that I mentioned. There's always that fear that someone's looking and and um, looking at them negatively. So adolescent egocentrism it it, expl it helps to explain um, the sense of uniqueness that many teenagers feel. And this intense focus on the self may in fact lead to a feeling of immortality, uh, which leads to those risk-taking behaviors, okay, um, and those uh, feelings of idealism, what they think a situation might be like, and they, they jump into it without thinking, and that pseudo-stupidity, because uh, again, they're risk-takers at this time, not really thinking. So when we, we critique um, Piaget's theory, what uh, they thought was that there was a lack of consistency. Of course, no two teenagers are alike. And um, usually they look at the age and, and universal, excuse me, universality. So culture plays a role. We talked about that on, on the first day. Um, ethnicity may play a role. Uh, different things may play a role in how it is um, adolescents develop when it comes to their cognitive development. So how do they process information? Well, um, higher order thought processes normally come into play. Again, there's the inference or um, the ability to generate new thoughts from old information. Thinking is the conscious, deliberate coordination of information. Uh, we'd like to think that our uh, adolescents are doing a little bit of both. Um, they usually tend to um, rely on, on negation rather than affirmation and um, use an elimination strategy. Um, and um, for as part of thinking as well, there's a self-serving bias and, and negative information, which is information that refutes their hypotheses. So what basically all this is saying is that, um, you know, there's a higher order thought process going on, um, usually with the, the later adolescent where it is they do begin to think things through. They do start to, to um, look at things um, from a more logical standpoint and eliminate, use elimination strategy or eliminate things that might actually cause them harm. But again, they still have this, uh, this um, risk-taking behavior and this feeling or sense of immortality that still gets them into to some uh, decision-making trouble. So Russ in 1981 proposed um, five skills of decision making. The first one was to identify alternate courses of action. Well, this is where it is parents come in because we try to really coach our teenagers into making the right decisions by giving them um, some alternatives. And usually if we push too hard, they normally go with the ones that, um, that we didn't want them to go with. So. Uh, decision making would be a whole lot better if the, if the adolescent would consider alternate courses of action as most adults do. Um, then there's identifying appropriate criteria for considering alternatives. Um, trying to figure out what's right from what's wrong. Assessing alternatives by criteria. Um, being able to, to basically look at, at the big picture. Summarizing information about alternatives and evaluating the outcome of the decision-making process. So being able to see way ahead into the future as to what the consequences will be for your actions. A lot of the time, um, adolescents don't think too far ahead. They just act and, again, find themselves in, in some situations, which is why the teenage years are some pretty tough years. Uh, there are some barriers, some limitations to good decision-making. Well, there's heuristics, uh, you know, it's rules of thumb or a technique or problem solving method that they're used to. Um, my friends are doing this, it seems to work for them. I think I'll make this decision and do the same thing too because I expect the same result. Um, they tend to overestimate things and, um, you know, rely upon intuition and feelings and emotions rather than analytic reasoning. So why is all this happening with the adolescent cognition? What's going on in their brains? Well, you have different parts of the brain that's responsible for different things. You have your frontal lobe. Um, this part here, your, your posterior uh, frontal and anterior parietal is for your, um, your uh, movement. Okay, so all of your, your motor control is, is happening right here. 
The occipital lobe takes in a lot of sensory information. This is where it is you, you get your visual information coming in. It gets processed. And um, right around here in your temporal lobe, you have quite a bit of things going on too. There's where it is you have your speech and comprehension um, as well as your auditory processing, sounds. And um, it, it gets coded into your memory. Uh, then there's your frontal lobe. This is the part that the adolescents have quite a bit of, of problems with. The frontal lobe, um, particularly the, the anterior uh, frontal lobe, which is towards the front, um, you know, is still developing into uh, up to age 25, right around that time. So that's why it is you, you see quite a bit of risk-taking behavior. So when you look at brain development, um, especially in the adolescent, we can see that the parietal lobe is for spatial reasoning. Um, the frontal lobe is for planning and, and impulse control. Then we have um, the temporal lobe for language and nonverbal communication. And the occipital lobe is for vision. So uh, and as it states here on this slide, the first three, the parietal, frontal, and temporal, um, they continue to develop well into adolescence and for the frontal lobe well into um, early adulthood. All right, so inside the temporal lobe, and this will be our final slide because um, I don't want to get too in-depth on the brain. Um, but for the brain development uh, part, and this being our final slide, inside the temporal lobe, there's the hippocampus. And this is involved with learning, memory, and motivation. Then there's the amygdala, which interprets incoming sensory information, which I mentioned in the other slide, the sensory information from your vision and your auditory uh, systems. And it causes us to respond in primal emotional ways that, uh, to that information. So um, it, what I wanted to mention on this slide is it's important to note that um, emotion is directly tied to memory. Um, without emotion, uh, you probably would have pretty pretty bad memory because uh, everything that we um, feel, we, we definitely remember if there's uh, some type of intense feeling with it. I'm sure you could think of times from adolescence, if it was an embarrassing feeling or hurtful feeling, whatever it was, uh, you still might have that memory today. So um, this is why I guess we, we don't forget we don't forget our adolescent phase because uh, there's so much emotions, uh, so many emotional uh, turbulences going on during that time that um, our teenage years are pretty much embedded into our, our adult memories. Okay, so the next chapter that we'll discuss will in fact be chapter six on self-concept, identity, ethnicity, and gender.